Good afternoon. I would also like to congratulate Owen on his ascension to the presidency of this university. It's a wonderful thing for him, and it, I know he will have a wonderful tenure here, and he's a great person who I enjoyed very much uh, with symposia and various things at Yale, and it's just a, it's a delight to be able to, hear, to be here to honor him. I'm going to talk a little bit about the aftermath of war. When the conflict was over, the question naturally arose, what was going to become of the four million African Americans who had been enslaved in the South? How would they fit into the nation that would rise after the end of the war? And I'm here because I wrote a book about a pivotal figure, Andrew Johnson, who succeeded Abraham Lincoln in the presidency after Lincoln's assassination. And Johnson was an interesting character because he was a product of a slave society. He was born in North Carolina, went to Tennessee, and was the only Southern senator who remained loyal to the Union when the conflict broke out. And it was that re for that reason, people, historians believe that he was chosen to be Lincoln's running mate, a very fateful decision, replacing Hannibal Hamlin of Maine with a man who remained loyal to the Union, who had been military governor in Tennessee during the war, and spoke very, very harshly about Southerners who had left the Union. He was seen as a person who was much more hardcore than Lincoln. Uh, members, uh, mem people in the South hated him, uh, if you think it's possible, even more so than they hated Lincoln because of his voluble talk about punishing traitors. And so there was a great amount of anticipation as to what would happen, how he would handle, answer that question, what was going to happen to the African Americans after the end of, of the war. And I want to read a quote from Frederick Douglass, who, encountering Andrew Johnson, discerned something in him that gave him a hint about what was going to happen. Frederick Douglass saw it in a brief glance he exchanged with Andrew Johnson during one of the most important rituals in the life of the American nation, performed at the most trying time in the country's history. It was March 4th, 1865, and Abraham Lincoln and Andrew Johnson were about to be sworn in as president and vice president, respectively, of the United States of America. Douglass did not know Andrew Johnson when he came to Washington that day, but the inaugural proceedings gave him a chilling look at the man from Tennessee. Douglass wrote, there are moments in the lives of most men when the doors of the soul are open and unconsciously to themselves, their true characters may be viewed by the observant eye. It was at such an instance when I caught a glimpse of the real nature of this man, which all subsequent developments proved true. I was standing in the crowd by the side of Mrs. Thomas J. Dorsey, when Mr. Lincoln touched Mr. Johnson and pointing me out to him. The first expression which came to his face, and which I think was the true index of his heart, was one of bitter contempt and aversion. Seeing that I had observed him, he tried to assume a more friendly appearance, but it was too late. It was useless to close the door when all within had been seen. His first glance was the frown of the man, the second was the bland and sickly smile of the demagogue. I turned to Mrs. Dorsey and said, whatever Andrew Johnson may be, he is no friend to our race. The sage of Anacostia got it exactly right. Johnson was no friend to black people at a time when blacks needed all the friends they could get. Because he believed that Lincoln would be the one to guide the United States to victory in the still raging war and help bring blacks to a new day, Douglas could afford to remark calmly to his companion when he came face to face with Johnson's true nature. He would have wailed, and probably did when it happened, had he any inkling that just a few weeks after this telling moment, an assassin's bullet would place the political fate of African Americans into the hands of a man who despised them. I think it's really important, and certainly in doing a book about a president and thinking of a president's character, to think about the influence that the president of the United States has or could have in a pivotal moment like that. Johnson it has sort of, his fortunes have risen and fallen over the years, different views about him among historians. Right now, he's probably at the nadir of people's um, opinions of him. Uh, there's an annual poll that is done, and I've participated in a number of years, and most years he is ranked in the bottom five of the presidents. Uh, in time for the publication of this book, he was ranked the worst. 
Um, he slid past Buchanan to make it to the worst. I don't quite understand what happened. Um, <laughs> but it's, he is, despite that, it's important to think about him and to know about Andrew Johnson because Reconstruction was such a critical period in American history and we're sort of still living with the effects of Reconstruction. Johnson, as I said, he was a product, he grew up in a slave society, but he was not a, he was not a slave owner, a large-scale slave owner himself until he became an adult. He was very poor growing up and developed a great amount of resentment against African Americans that he voiced pretty frequently and pretty openly uh, to people around him. And so there was one side of him that made people think that he was going to avenge um, sort of avenge uh, the, the North, uh, uh, the Northern, the Union against uh, what he considered to be traitors. There was another side of him that made him very, very wary of the possibility of African Americans becoming full citizens. You don't want to think, I'm not a devotee of great man history. You cannot blame one person for all of the good things that happen in society, nor can you blame a person for all the bad things. But having a president the person who has the bully pulpit, the person who is supposed to be the energy of the country in the position as the, during this time period when you're trying to figure out what is supposed to happen to African Americans, I think was a very, very fateful thing. And as, as I said, sort of accounted for a number of things that happened during that time period and that still haunt us today. Johnson, after he was in office, began to see that congressional Republicans, the so-called radical Republicans, who by the way, never really had the influence that, that people think they did. It was mainly the moderates and conservatives who control the party, but the radical Republicans wanted to transform the South. They felt the only thing that could be done to protect African Americans was to give them political rights. And I should say that even the moderate and conservative Republicans during that time period felt the same thing. Uh, they were not willing to go as far as the radical Republicans, but basically giving the blacks to vote was something that most people in the Republican Party thought was the thing to do.